The church in Thessalonica had really been through it. Paul, in writing the first epistle to them, we saw, was very concerned about the persecution they had undergone and the, the frustration that naturally has to grow in them as a result of it. It had two interesting side effects. One, it created a certain frustration and a, and a thrashing around about, why am I here? It's a logical question. You know, why, why am I going through this? Why is it that, that I've got to go to jail? Why is it that, that a member of my family lost his life for all this? If I, am I doing the right thing? Have I, have I made a mistake somehow? What is this crazy religion I've gotten myself into? Who is this man? Is he sane, this Paul, this Saul of Tarsus? The other effect of it was a tremendous strengthening of the church. Because going through and, and surviving trials and tribulations and especially sharing them with other people creates a bond of love between people that is almost unbreakable. But also, as a result of this, Paul, of course, in his first epistle, is trying his best to encourage them. He uses a little formula having to do with the resurrection and the return of Christ at the end of every chapter. And his whole point is to try to help these people to be focused on the return of Christ. He did a good job. In fact, he almost did his job too well because they got somewhat confused about the return of Christ and the time of it. And so people were making some rather bad decisions about the return of Christ or in expectation of the return of Christ. Let's take a look at this second epistle of Thessalonians because after they had read the first epistle and after there had been time to gauge their reaction, Paul found it quite necessary to write a second epistle to the Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. Paul and Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all toward each other abounds. A beautiful thing to see. And as I said before, it was something that was almost predictable, because knowing that this church had been persecuted and knowing the way they had endured it together, sure, they lost a few people. They even had some people become disheartened and quit. But those who remained had an incredible love for one another, for God, for his work, the response in their lives was tremendous. The church was growing in faith, and it was growing fast. Verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God. Paul bragged about them to the other churches. For their patience, their faith in all their persecutions and tribulations that they endure. Now, he makes an interesting statement here. This patience, this faith in tribulation is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. What does that mean? Well, he's simply saying that God, who is going to render vengeance, or recompense, as he says in verse 6, tribulation to those that trouble him, their patient endurance of tribulation is a, a manifest token that God's judgment is right. Read on. That you may be accounted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you suffer. Sometimes people have a hard time understanding why it is that God lets them go through some of the problems they go through. Why me, Lord? Why, why does this have to happen to my son? Why, why has my daughter become sick? Why, why am I in jail? Why, why do I have to go through this thing that I'm going through? Paul says that all these things that you endure, your patience, your, your faith, your confidence, is a token of the, of the judgment of God, of the righteousness of God's judgment, that you may be accounted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. Why is it good, why is it useful for man to suffer? Because Paul seems to say that it is. Well, there are some aspects of it that are fairly obvious. On the one hand, the endurance of suffering and the overcoming of, of suffering builds a tremendous amount of character in a man. We're all familiar with the, the stories of people who have overcome great handicaps and have become greater people as a result of it. It is something like that, but it's more. 
those who are in the service of God, who know that they're called of God, who know that they have been used of God, have experienced a common phenomenon in their lives. They have gone through a trial or a tribulation of some sort, uh, have suffered some particular indignity, only to maybe a week or two or three later, or maybe a little longer, to encounter some other human being with precisely the same problem. It's almost seemed uncanny at times. It's almost as though God, with his omniscience, looks ahead and sees some poor soul about to undergo a terrible trial, one that he's going to have a great deal of difficulty with and one that he's going to need a lot of encouragement in. And he has found a servant whom he can allow to endure the same trial ahead of time, strengthen him, so that when the time comes, he may sit down across the room or in a chair opposite some poor soul that's struggling and fighting for his life and say, Fella, I know exactly how you feel. I've been there myself. I fought the same battle. You know, it's awfully easy when you're downhearted and you're discouraged and somebody's sitting there trying to tell you why it's not all as bad as you think it is, to lash out at the person and say, How would you know? How would you know? You've never been there. You've never had to undergo this. And, you know, it makes a lot of difference if the person who is trying to help us has gone through it. And we know that he or she understands. I recall one time a uh, man had called me on the phone to talk about a particular problem that I had no solution for. I really didn't know what to tell him. Uh, it was a battle that he was going to have to fight, struggle through himself. And so as he talked, about all I could say was, I understand. I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. And I did it again and again, and I kind of felt inadequate in a way when the conversation was over. I wished that I could have told the man something. I wished that I could have given him something. I, I wished that I had an answer for him. I didn't find out till a lot later that I had had the answer for him. Because when I told him, I understood. I really did. I didn't have the answer, but I did understand him and what he was saying, and I felt for him. And he told me later, he said, you'll never know how much those two words meant to me that day. The words, I understand. It's pretty important, and I think that one of the reasons why the servants of God do suffer from time to time is to help us to understand. So that whenever we sit to talk with another human being, we can say to him, I know how you feel, and mean it. And he can't come back and say, no, you don't know how I feel. You've never been there because you've told him. I, I have been there. I have experienced the problem you have. I know how it feels. And who knows? Maybe you can even tell him how you whipped it. He goes on then to say in verse 6, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Notice, not an everlasting destroying, not everlasting punishing, but everlasting destruction. When you're destroyed, you're destroyed. And that destruction lasts. I mean, it's over. It's finished. It, it's, it's destruction has taken place, and there's no repairing of it. It is a destruction which is everlasting. When he shall come, verse 10, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Man, that's a statement. To realize that in the endurance of suffering, in the struggling through a tribulation, in the overcoming of opposition, in the living of a life, that the name of Jesus Christ can be glorified in me is almost overwhelming. It's encouraging. But it also lays an enormous burden of responsibility upon the shoulders of any man who assumes the role of a Christian 
in this world. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 is one of the most fascinating subjects ever discussed in the New Testament. It has an obscurity about it that uh, has baffled people for generations, and I doubt that I'm going to solve it for you today. But it's worth studying because I think that in the months or years to come, certain events are going to come to pass which will make this scripture locked together. The Thessalonians understood it up to a point. Beyond that point, they did not understand it because even though it sounded like it was for their day, even though it sounded like something that would take place in their lifetime, it did not. And so the things that they thought they saw, they thought were fulfillments of this, could have only been a pale shadow of what was to come at the end time, a, a type, as it were, or a historical model. Let's read it. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I think probably rather than by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, a demon, a vision, uh, something of this nature, nor by word, somebody's sermon or preaching or idea, nor by a letter as from us. That's fascinating. He seems to be implying the fact that there were some forged letters going around at the time, purporting to be letters from Paul. So don't be disturbed by a letter purporting to be from us. As that, the day of Christ is at hand. Now, Paul makes a fascinating statement because always the New Testament writers seem to be saying that the day of Christ is at hand. It's going to come to pass now. It's in our lifetime. There seems to be a, a great urgency about it. But here's an exception to that, where Paul writes to a church uh, who has really taken things a little too far and has overreacted to his previous letter. And he says to them, don't get shook up about this because the day of Christ is not at hand. There are some things that have to happen first. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come first the apostasy. A word about apostasy, this falling away. A person who has already fallen and is uh, lying on the ground can't fall any further. Thus, no person can apostatize from error. You only apostatize from the truth. So we're not talking about uh, people falling away from some other religion other than the true religion. Paul then looks ahead to the future, and he says there is something that has to take place prior to the return of Christ. It is a thing called the apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5 is important. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And therein lies our problem. Paul was never with us in person, and he never told us these things in person. And with his elliptical style, by elliptical I mean he implies certain things that he does not say, and he assumes a certain knowledge on the part of his audience. We don't have uh, the full set of information that the Thessalonians had to read, to evaluate, to put things together. We don't have, to put it another way, the pegs to hang these scriptures on so that we really know how they relate to one another. So we're a little bit in the dark compared to the Thessalonians, because he says to them in verse 6, and now you know. Well, I sure don't. Here I am down in the 20th century, and I look back down through these years, and I say to myself, boy, they knew something I didn't make. No, because although I can come to some ideas, although I can have a theory of this prophecy, as far as being able to say, oh, I know what this is all about. I'm sorry, I don't. And I don't know anyone else that does, although I know some people who think they do. Let no man deceive you, he says. So somebody may very well try to deceive you in the process of all this, to try to tell you that the day of Christ is at hand. But there is a certain person 
who has to be unveiled. The word revealed is apocalypsis. It means essentially uh, unveiling like the book of Revelation. So it implies that he exists, but that he is not unveiled prior to a certain period of time. And apparently, even before or contemporary with him, must come a thing called the apostasy, some great falling away from the truth. Who is this man of sin? Obviously, he's talking about somebody that they knew about, had reason to know about. Well, as a matter of fact, there is a person in the Bible who is referred to sort of in this way, although the term man of sin is not used for this person. Turn back, if you would, to the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. In Daniel, the 11th chapter, he speaks of a vile person, verse 21, who is going to stand up in a, in a time of great trouble. Chapter 11 talks about the king of the south and the king of the north. I won't go into the great details about uh, the historical background of that. It's covered in a tape called The Antichrist, uh, which I would like to redo at some time in the future, but the one that's available now is, is adequate to give you the, the broad historical perspective of the time and this individual or this man who is going to be the Antichrist, perhaps mistakenly called so, but people have come to look upon that vile person or upon the man of sin or upon the beast of Revelation as this uh, Antichrist. He is called a vile person in Daniel 11. Now, historically, the person spoken of in Daniel 11 as the vile person, this one who is the type of the man of sin, has been universally understood by commentators down through the years to be one Antiochus Epiphanes, a man who was not a Jew. He was not a man who followed even a counterfeit of the, the true religion of God. He was a man who advocated, advanced, pushed forward Hellenism, the Hellenistic style of life, the Greek style of life, including the worship of the Greek gods. He went to some incredible lengths to suppress the worship of God, the true God, even to the point of uh, stopping the daily sacrifice in the temple, of having penalties for anyone who practiced any outward form of, of Judaism. It became worth your life to be found to be circumcised. As a matter of fact, he forbade the practice entirely. Young men actually underwent an operation, to, uh, some sort of a skin graft, to make it look like they had not been circumcised during his time. A very violent man. He went into the temple of God, offered swine flesh upon the altar, and set up a statue of Jupiter Olympus in the Holy of Holies, which came to be called the Abomination of Desolation, something Jesus referred to in the Olivet Prophecy, that when you see the Abomination of Desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, let him who reads understand. Let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. He said, you know the desolation thereof of Jerusalem is nigh. All these things have been explained elsewhere. I won't go into them further at this time. But it tells us that this man is going to have a, a powerful persecuting influence on the world. We're told in verse 36 of Daniel 11, the king shall do according to his will, he will exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. He shall not regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god. For he shall magnify himself above all. Now, in Paul's day, Almost anyone would have seen this in some degree in the Roman emperors of the time, and particularly in the case of Nero. For they weren't thinking in terms of a, an apostasy from the true church, which was really quite small, and some individual, some man of sin arising up out of the church to, to play the role of this person in Daniel 11 as of a, a false Christian, as it were. They thought in terms of a Roman emperor who was God in his own eye, who did oppose at time one time or another all that was called God, although they did worship the God of their fathers up until this time. They worshipped, in many cases, the Greek gods. There was a certain pantheistic approach among some of the Roman emperors, except that they themselves were a God king. So naturally, the church would have tended to look in that direction as of the Roman emperor, and certainly there was in Nero a sort of fulfillment of Antiochus Epiphanes, of the prophecies concerning this man of sin. And yet we find John 
at a much later time, after Nero is dead and gone, looking ahead to the future and forecasting at the very time of the end, yet another. And of course, even though the first century church may have believed it was Nero, there's no way the 20th century church can believe it. For Paul said this is to take place at the end time, at the return of Christ. All right, the key on this Antiochus Epiphanes being connected with the man of sin is Daniel 11, verse 36, that he shall speak marvelous things against the God of God, that he will exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. These are the things that the man of sin is to do. Now let's turn back to the 13th chapter of Revelation, where we find another reference to the same person. Revelation 13, verse 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And this man of sin was to be a blasphemer. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Notice. The beast was like a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion. Where else in the Bible do you find these, uh, these symbols? Well, you go back again to the book of Daniel. And they are the sequential representations in animal form of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Alexander. And then, of course, you have this fourth strange beast that is to rise up. So what you have here in this beast is the legitimate offspring, as it were, or the successor or the continuation, depending upon what particular analogy you want to draw, but the, the continuation of the Babylonian kingdom that is expressed in Nebuchadnezzar's image and in all of the different kinds of visions of, of Daniel. You also have one who is going to be worshipped. We find in verse 3 that he says, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered, gaped after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, symbolic, of course, of Satan, Revelation 12, 9, which gave the power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, you can look at this in one of two ways. You can look at this beast that is worshipped as the emperor or the king at this end time, who is the one personification of all that is here. Or you may look upon it really as the worship of the state, which some have interpreted it. Continuing. Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now, that implies that this person is a military power. You have to realize, as you're going along in here, that the old, uh, old Protestant explanation that this is the Pope won't work, or that he's a religious leader, it won't, won't wash, because this is a, an international figure. He is a, an international military power going on. There was given to him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue for 42 months, a very precise period of time allocated to this one. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. He opposes all that is called God and speaks against God. Easy to identify this then with, with the man of sin, easy to identify with uh, Daniel, Yet there are some problems. We go on. He was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's an interesting statement. Because it tells us that those who have achieved salvation, those who have been repented of their sins, been baptized, have received the Holy Spirit, whose names are written in the book of life, will not worship the beast. They can't be deceived. They can't be conned. They can't be slipped up on. For the people, the clear distinction is made as to who will worship the beast and who will not worship the beast. It is those who have had their name written in the book of life. They can't go and be conned into following the beast. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with a sword shall be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. 
Now let's keep our place here in Revelation 13 and go back to Second uh, Thessalonians 2 once again. This man of sin, we are told, is going to oppose, verse 4, exalt himself above all that is called God. That means it's going to have to be exalted above Buddhism, Shintoism, or all the religions of the world. All that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things. Now you know what withholdeth, or now you know what restrains, that he might be revealed in his time. Well, concerning this beast back here, there was a 42-month period. He wasn't something that was going to exist indefinitely. There was a very specific time for this person to be on the scene, and he had to be there before Christ could come. All right. Back to Revelation 13 again. He says in verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of the men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast. So he is somewhat contemporary with the beast, isn't he? Although he seems to come up almost later, he doesn't say that this man is later. He just says, I saw another beast. So this statement, he does it in the sight of the beast, shows that these two beasts are contemporary. And if you study Revelation carefully, you'll find the second beast referred to otherwise as the false prophet later on in the book of Revelation. So this person, different from this other one that's going to continue for 42 months, has the power to do all sorts of, of miracles, to deceive those people that dwell on the earth by the means of the miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had the power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had that mark or the number of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. That him that has understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. The number is six hundred three score and six. Now, other scriptures in Revelation equate the worshiping of the beast and of its image uh, with the receiving of the mark of the beast and so forth as to those who are going to be punished. Who is it that's going to worship the beast and his image? Back in verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, all of them whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, back to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 again. Paul says, Remember you not, then, that when I was with you, I told you these things. Now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. Now, he hasn't said anything about anything restraining anything to this time, and yet he says to the Thessalonians, Now you know what restrains. For the mystery of iniqu iniquity does already work. Paul saw something in the world at that time. He saw something in the realm of his of the earthly kingdom and of the church as well, that he calls the mystery of iniquity. The Greek basically is mystery of lawlessness. He uses the word anomion, which means basically a law, no law. So the mystery of lawlessness, he said, is already at work. But apparently there was something yet to come out of it. What? The apostasy and the man of sin. He says the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only... He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When will this man exist? He will exist at the return of Christ. And since this beast was given 42 months, there's no reason to give the second beast any more than that either. We are dealing with a very concrete and very tight period in time. Now, this is somewhat confused by the fact that the Apostle Paul, and I have no doubt the Thessalonians, looked at this as something that was going to take place in their lifetime. 
they saw a movement afoot in the church, and a no-law movement afoot in the church, which Paul calls the mystery of iniquity. He assumed, and apparently they did as well, that this would lead to an apostasy, and out of this would come a man of sin. Interestingly enough, some, some manuscripts, instead of having man of sin, have man of anomias, or man of iniquity, or man of lawlessness, uh, instead of man of sin. So the, the whole idea of it was that some person was going to come up or rise up out of all this that would, would uh, become a dominant figure and fulfill these prophecies. That mystery of, um, of iniquity that Paul spoke of, that was already at work in his own time, apparently continued generation after generation and is with us today. As we come down to the very end time, we still have yet to see revealed the man of sin. Now, a lot of Protestants uh, have seen in this man of sin uh, the Pope. The idea was that the apostasy took place in Paul's own day and that the institution of the papacy became that, that man of sin. David Antion quite rightly asked the question, if, if this man of sin is supposed to surprise anybody, uh, he certainly wouldn't surprise the Protestants, because if you look back in the introduction to your King James Version of the Bible, you will find the Pope referred to as the man of sin, clinging back at the time when the King James translation was done. And Catholics, by and large, have believed that ever since. But if we look to Daniel, to our man Antiochus Epiphanes, we have to realize that uh, he was not a Jew. He certainly was not a Christian, of course, and he was a man of a totally different religion. He was a civil leader to start with, who became a god-king of sorts and persecuted the true religion. And so why would we necessarily expect uh, this to somehow be Christian-related? Well, we may have some interesting things ahead of us to take place, to, which may blindside a few people who are expecting things to work out in a certain way. Let's ask a couple of questions here, though, about before we get away from the subject. What is this thing that was restrained? What is it that's holding back? There have been a number of theories advanced on this. Uh, one commentary, for example, suggests that it might very well be that, that the Roman Empire itself was a restraining influence. And this is the idea that the papacy was to become the, uh, the man of sin, as it were, as an institution rather than as a single given person, and that the Roman Empire, by being in Rome, did suppress and hold that Roman church in control for quite a while until Constantine moved the church, or sorry, until Constantine moved the headquarters of the Roman Empire to Istanbul or Constantinople. When they left there, they were out of the way and opened the way for the Catholic Church to become dominant, or that is for the Roman Church to become dominant in the world at that time and form the primary leadership for the uh, Roman Catholic Church as it was to later become. And they saw in that the man of sin. Uh, others suggest that it was the Apostle Paul and his presence at that time which was restraining this mystery of, an, of iniquity from developing or becoming strong and kept the apostasy from taking place. And then after Paul's death, when he was taken out of the way, that the Gentile churches then began to go to fall away very rapidly into paganism and pagan worship, and that it was through that means that the, the uh, institution of the man of sin got developed. And that is certainly true as far as it goes in the first century. It doesn't, however, answer all the questions having to do with Revelation 13 and that which is to take place at the very end time. Now you know. Oh, by the way, there is another theory that is advanced on this. I think it's Dr. Hay who advances this one, that the what this means is that since the day of Christ cannot come unless certain things take place, then the fact that those things have not taken place restrains the kingdom of God from coming. Not that anybody is able to keep it, but just simply the, the non-occurrence of the events is a restraining factor. Then he says in verse 6, Now you know what withholds or restrains the day of the Lord from coming, and that is the non-appearance of the man of sin. Uh, that was a little difficult to support uh, in really careful studying of the Greek that is here. The Greek says very simply, Now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only the restrainer will restrain until he be out of the midst. Very obscure. Not in the least bit clear. 
But the implication is that there was, there was something or someone who was restraining this man of sin from actually appearing or taking place. That we'll have to watch. Going on now to verse 9, or rather going on to verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. This is fascinating in a way because what we're now here being described is the second beast of Revelation 13. At least the description fits the second beast of Revelation 13 better than it does the first on superficial comparison. One theory that we might just advance at this point for people to study and to think about is are we really dealing with one person or two persons in Second Thessalonians? For in truth, in Revelation 13, we are dealing with not one, but two. In Revelation 13, we are dealing with a civil leader and a religious leader who causes people to worship the civil leader. It takes a little following, doesn't it? But you have a beast and a false prophet. You have the first beast, you have the second beast. The first beast has power, he is worshipped as a god. The second beast, a religious institution, performs miracles. Well, suppose that in Second Thessalonians 2, we have, first of all, an apostasy and the revealing of the man of sin. Suppose that is the first beast of Revelation 13. The son of perdition. That's interesting because that is used for Judas. Judas is the only other person in the Bible where that term is used, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or does worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, I told you these things. Now you know what holds it back so that he could be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work, only the restrainer will restrain until he is out of the way. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. Suppose that that were the second beast of Revelation 13, the false prophet, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Huh. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, I would have to still be perhaps a bit inclined toward our Original explanation being that the man of sin and the wicked one here are the same person. It's just a development of the theme. It certainly would seem to read that way more in the Greek. It seems to be an integrated subject. And yet the possibility has to be admitted for examination that we are dealing not with one person but with two, the man of sin and that wicked one. The word wicked, by the way, a different word from anomia, but still means basically a lawless person, an anti or no law person. Now, when we take a look at all this, there are some fascinating questions to be, to be raised. For example, the question in verse 4, at the very end time, this person is going to sit in the temple of God, showing that he is God. Now, if you believe that there is to be no physical temple constructed at the end time, then you have to conclude that the temple refers symbolically to something else. And if you begin to search the scriptures to find out what there is else that the Bible symbolically refers to, there's only one thing left. What is it? It's the church. Now, I've heard people suggest recently that those prophecies dealing with the temple are, you know, that there will not be another temple built before Christ returns, and those prophecies are prophecies of the church. Now, if that is true, then you are faced with a very difficult question, that the man of sin who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, is going to sit in the church of God, being worshipped as though he were God. It is a sobering, no, it's a frightening concept to consider. But it's one that has to be placed up there among all the rest of the theories that have been advanced on this for your consideration, for if indeed there is to be no temple built at the end time, if indeed the church is the temple, prophetically speaking, then there is going to arise a person in the church who is going to be worshipped as though he were God. 
well, this man of sin that is to appear, or this this uh, wicked one who is going to be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders is going to deceive everybody but the very elect, Jesus told us. This person is going to come with all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish because, okay, they're perishing for a reason. They're deceived by this person for a reason. What's the reason? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Something came between these people and the truth. Something became more important to them than the truth. The Bible tells us what truth is. It says categorically, thy, to speaking to God, what is truth? Thy word is truth. And so when we want to understand what, what we are to love, what we are to cherish, what we are to hold up, it is the word of God. Here are people who did not receive the love of the truth. They somehow got involved in idolatry, I guess, because they placed something else. Perhaps it was the word of a man. Perhaps it was a tradition of the church. For indeed, a tradition, long cherished tradition of the church, could be contrary to the truth. And of course, a church can also change the things that they believe. For this cause, because they didn't hold on to the truth, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be condemned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ah, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now, that doesn't contradict. What Paul is saying is that you keep the traditions, unless, of course, those traditions are found to be in conflict with the very word of God. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. Now, reviewing this second chapter and thinking carefully about what we've seen, it's confusing, isn't it? There are conflicting theories, conflicting opinions, and it's, uh, it's not my purpose in this today to try to come down hard on one or the other or to say this is the way it is, because we're dealing with a, a very obscure prophecy in this case, one that is not at all clear in its meaning as to how it is to be understood. But there is to come, at the end time, an apostasy. There is to come almost as though it were out of the apostasy, one individual who is going to be referred to as a man of sin, who puts himself into a godlike position. It is to your defense, those of you who have your names written in the book of life, that you hold the love of the truth that is of God's word, an affection for it, an attention to it, an awareness of the things that it says, that you prove all things, that you... Do not believe what you are told unless you can find it in the pages of your Bible. For strong delusion is going to be upon all this world. And it will deceive those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So this one is to come in one way or another. And I think the predominance of opinion still is that there will be an international figure who actually will, in Jerusalem, in some edifice that may, might be called a temple of God, show himself that he is very God. But there is a restraining influence. For some period of time, something is holding this back so that he can be revealed at his time. For the mystery of the lawlessness, this thing is already at work at large in the world. Only the restraining force will continue until it be out of the midst. We'll just have to wait and see exactly what that means. But when that restraining force is out of the way, out of the midst, gone, then a wicked one is going to be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now let's go on to chapter 3. 
Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. You know, I know what he means. The word unreasonable, I think, in your margin is also absurd, and, and it's just uh, the problem of, of people who, in absurd arguments and, and strivings and fightings against the truth, seem to manage to continually deceive little ones in the church. Paul just said, be sure and con continue to remember in your prayers that we may be delivered from absurd, unreasonable, and wicked men. For, and Paul likes to use understatement, all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and the patient, steadfast waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he begins now to address some particular church problems, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received from us. Now he's dealing with a, a particular problem. But basically there is a body of tradition and of order in the church that one is supposed to follow. And he says that if you find somebody that, that's, that's walking in a disorderly fashion and is not continuing along the lines of the order that you have been taught, and that you have looked into the Bible and found is there as well, that you just withdraw yourselves from that person. Now, this is man is still a brother, but the fact of the matter is that somehow or other, there's got to be a break in this contact and this, this spread of such an absurd or unreasonable approach to the truth. And so he just says, get away from him, withdraw yourself, just don't spend time with such a person. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we did not behave ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing. But we worked with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now, Paul tried. Now, this is not to say that Paul never received money from anybody. He certainly did. He received money from the Philippians on more than one occasion, for example. But he did make it a habit not to take money from the people he served directly. It's an encouraging thing, and he says this, not because we didn't have the power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. In other words, I had the, I had the authority when I came in there. I could have preached to you and then passed the plate and taken up an offering to support myself. It isn't that I didn't have the right to do that, but I did an example different from that because I want you to follow that example. And Paul's example in the Bible is not to take money from the people he is serving, it, because it almost becomes to him an unclean thing. It's almost as though I preach to you and you pay me, and it creates an unwholesome relationship. But if I preach to you freely, and I earn my own way, or I am supported by other Christians whom I am not serving now, they're not paying me to serve them. They are supporting me to serve you. It's a healthy relationship. It does seem important for the minister to be independent, financially independent, of the people he is preaching to. You know, it doesn't take much imagination to figure out why. Because if people can begin to bring pressure to bear upon a preacher, they can begin to control the things that he preaches. They can begin to intimidate him from saying things that he ought to say. No, not every preacher. While he may have the faith to preach, and he may have the convictions to preach, he may not always have the courage to fly in the face of a church board or a board of deacons who begin to bring pressure to him about things that they don't necessarily like to hear. He's got four kids, and they're in school, and he's got shoes to buy and, and school supplies and a house mortgage and so forth to pay. It can be an awfully difficult thing for him to manage. And so Paul kept himself free of that. The letter to the Corinthians is really interesting because he... He was at great pains there to explain to them how he had done it, and he gave them his reasons for it. Here he gives a reason that varies just ever so slightly. But I think we get down to the bedrock because he says, I didn't want to be chargeable to any of you. In other words, he wanted to maintain his independence. Important. For even, he says, verse 10, when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Really a very, very simple principle that should really govern all of our approach to welfare. That if a person can work and won't work, then they shouldn't eat. There's no reason to give financial aid to someone who's not willing to put out some effort. 
For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working, busybodies. It's almost as though some people who thought Christ was coming very soon now had quit their jobs. You have that feeling from this. Now them that are such, he said, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread, not somebody else's. Now, you brethren, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't give up. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. In other words, just pull away. You don't have to count him as an enemy. You don't have to to uh, create some kind of a financial problem by refusing to do business with him. He just basically is saying that, that just withdraw from a man who isn't going to go down the same road that we're going with. I think one of the things he wanted to see, of course, was repentance on the part of that person who was struggling in that way. Yet, he says, count him not an enemy, verse 15, but admonish him as a brother. So it's not a question of not of refusing to talk to the person. It's not, you've got to talk to a person if you're going to admonish him as a brother. It's not disfellowshipment or marking in the sense that it is practiced by some churches that are exclusivist in nature. It is really just a simple matter of backing off from social contact with people who are either disorderly or who are unwilling to follow the instructions of the leadership of the church and just help them to realize that, hey, you are not one of us. We love you, and you know we, we, we respect you as a human being, but you are not really a member of this church because you don't agree with the things that we're doing. Now, the Lord of peace himself, give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Apparently he wrote his own conclusion out by hand so they'd know it was from him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.